May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So indeed, we do start a bit of a, a summer sermon series on the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. It used to be pretty weird to me, this book of Acts, with tongues of fire dancing on people's head that we'll hear about next week. There was just some things that I was not interested in, but the more I became interested in history, the more I really enjoyed reading the book of the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. This book begins, as Charlie read earlier, chapter 1, verse 1, in the first book, Theophilus. Which reminds us that there was a book prior to this one, a book that we attribute to a man named Luke, or a writer named Luke, who also writes this book because they both start with an address to someone named Theophilus. Theophilus. But Theophilus could be someone's because the word or the name Theophilus, Philos, uh, means something about love, as in Philadelphia, and then Theophilus. Theo or Theos means something about God. So, dear lover of God, dear each one of you, you who gather for worship this day, dear God lover, let me tell you more about this Jesus. I've done a lot of research. I've heard the stories and now I've compiled them. This is what Luke says to all of us God lovers. It starts from there. And then verse 1 says, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. It starts with Jesus. Dear God lover, let me share you this great story with Jesus. Maybe Theophilus had commissioned Luke. Maybe Theophilus had given Luke the money to write the book. <laughs> Maybe Theophilus was just curious and or a doubter or someone who had never heard of Jesus. Maybe Theophilus could have been anyone, but, it's, but Luke starts with Jesus. Let me tell you about all that Jesus did. And so you think back to the Gospel of Luke, of Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. And then Jesus' miracles and parables, stories that we don't hear anywhere else, like the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son. And then the story of Jesus' suffering, which verse 3, Acts chapter 1 has. After his suffering, meaning when Jesus was was arrested, when he was beaten up, when he was put to death on the cross, when he was raised from the dead, it says he then presented himself alive. No one else had done this. Alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them over the course of 40 days. From Easter to this past Thursday was 40 days, and that's why we read this text today. 40, now 43-ish plus days, 44 days. And he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. He said it's like so many different things. It's like the Mooresville baseball team being the 11th seed, coming back and winning the state championship. Being down 2-0 to zero in two games and coming back to win both games. The kingdom of God sometimes overcomes great obstacles. The kingdom of God is small, like a tiny mustard seed of faith. The kingdom of God looks like re loving relationships. The kingdom of God looks like vital congregations that still continue to serve. It looks like you and me involved in the life and ministry and acts of the Holy Spirit. But these disciples, these apostles, Luke says, they're standing there and they say, well, Lord, gosh, is this going to be the time when you restore the kingdom to Israel? They missed the boat. They missed the point. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, and they say the kingdom of Israel. Jesus says, first of all, no one knows when. That's up to God. And secondly, you are going to have the power to work in the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of God. You have the power. The word power in Greek is where we get the word dynamite from, the dynamis. It's a dangerous thing. <laughs> you're going to have this danger, and you're going to have to treat it well, and you're going to have to figure out how to keep it as well as how to use it, this dynamite, this power. And the power is called the Holy Spirit. And you are going to be my witnesses then, not just in Jerusalem and Judea, but to Samaria and to all the ends of the earth, even to Mooresville, North Carolina. And so here we are. That's the way it starts. That's the way it starts, being part of the kingdom of God, being filled with the Holy Spirit, walking wet through the waters of baptism. 
This early church wrestled then with what does this mean? All of a sudden, Jesus is taken up out of their midst, and they are left standing there, staring up. Two men in white. We don't know who they are, what their names are. They're wearing white robes. They show up. There's all sorts of different little cute stories about who these two guys might be. Maybe they were friends and neighbors in Egypt once upon a time of Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus when they had to flee and be exiles in Egypt. Maybe these two guys had returned from Egypt to see whatever happened to Jesus and they show up about the time that he's being raised from the dead and they walk with him for 40 days and then as he has ascended they're telling these other followers the apostles quit looking up get down to business <laughs> Jesus is no longer with us therefore we gotta love neighbor as ourselves as Joseph and Mary and Jesus taught us and showed us when we lived in the land of Egypt there are other possible stories about who these guys in white may be, might be but the bottom line is they send in the name of Jesus, they send the disciples back out to go do the work and the acts that Jesus would have them do. The second reading that, that Charlie read is then a wrestle, a wrestling with leadership. Who is this new community? And this new community is pretty Jewish. Very Jewish. Eleven men. And they need one more. And so they, they roll dice. They have lots. And they choose the one with only one name versus the guy with the three names. Three names have been too hard to remember. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice. Nah, we're not going to mess with him. How about Matthias? Yeah, that's easy to remember. So he becomes the twelfth guy. But this community is already different. Not, they are Jewish, and currently they're men, but it says they're more than that. It says that Jesus' brothers are there too, another three or four men. And not only that, but there are women there too. Women are part of this early community, including Jesus' mother Mary, it says. All of a sudden, men and women are now the leaders. And not just 11 plus 1 is 12, plus 4 is 15, plus a few more is 19 or 20 or 20. All of a sudden, there are 120. 120 in this new community. Acts goes on to start naming numbers of things and of people and of groups. Pay attention when you're reading the book of Acts to some of those numbers. How they go up and then they go down. Luke is trying, though, to say, here is who we are. Here is this community revolving around relationship with women and with men, relationship with Jesus, relationship with the Holy Spirit, relationship with doing God's work with our hands. With that in mind, the last couple days at the North Carolina Senate Assembly, we do tell the story of what our church, the church in North Carolina, the ELCA in the nation, and the Lutheran church around the world is doing. We talk about the acts of the church, the acts of the Holy Spirit with us and in us in 2019, 2018 and 2019 especially. Bishop Smith addressed the 466 attendees saying the word synod means walking together. Walking together with the Holy Spirit, walking together with one another, walking together with 199 congregations, walking together with nine different ministries including camps and colleges and seminaries and Lutheran services, Carolinas, among other ways of walking together. He says, he said, we are communities of Jesus. We are not congregations of Jesus. We are communities of Jesus like the book of Acts talks about. The work of Christ is not done in congregations alone. We have all sorts of communities within the North Carolina Synod that are doing Christ's work. In addition to our churches, the Spirit is working in and through agencies, service organizations, institution camps, and more. At this assembly, we recognized and celebrated what was do being done in each of those vital communities communities. He said, in our vital communities, we nurture life-changing relationships. That's what it's all about, relationships. You are ready to do that, said Bishop Smith. So why would we focus on something we already know? Bishop Sh Smith shared his theory. Isn't it true that the things we need the most are the things we long to hear? Even though, he said, when I told my wife uh, years ago when we got married that I loved her, 
she doesn't think that's enough. She wants me to tell her every day, I love you. <laughs> so we need to concentrate on the things that we know and to repeat those things every day. He says, yes, it's meaningful to hear the things we already know. That's what we do in our communities and at Synod Assembly. We gather over and over to hear the things that we already know to be true because we need to be reminded of these things often. So as we gathered at Synod Assembly, we heard and shared stories of vital communities. We heard the story of a, of a young lady who's been going up to a Lutheran, from, uh, originally from Africa, part of a Lutheran church in High Point, who the last, last summer, and again this summer, goes up to a Lutheran college in Minnesota for faith, science, and the ethics camp. And she loves it, 17 years old. We heard the stories of Lutheran men in mission, among others, doing the work of post-hurricane cleanup and working with people who lost everything in eastern North Carolina. It was very emotional testimonies that people got up and shared with tears and the devastation that they've experienced with floods and their thanksgiving to churches like St. Mark's and others who participated in prayers and financial giving as well as through some hands-on help as we continue to work with those impacted by floods. We talked about what the Holy Spirit is doing in our congregations. We reminded ourselves that we don't have a single story that Jesus' word is always changing communities and changing things that we're not the same yesterday as we will be tomorrow. That we're always moving forward for the sake of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts does the same thing. It reminds us of that. Jesus starts by giving the apostles a challenge and a gift of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter takes on the challenge first of all. And then Timothy and Philip and Lydia and Dorcas and Paul and others continue the life-giving work and ministry to many, many others across Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As we read through the book of Acts, June and July, we'll also be challenged to see where our congregation fits in both then and now and how the Spirit continues to lead us with God's acts into the future. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O Lord, for all your many acts to bless vital communities, to bless relationships, to bless us as your hands doing your work in Mooresville and the community around us. May your spirit guide us and keep us, open our ears to your scripture as we read at home the work of Acts this summer and as we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the actions that we know of through this congregation and the, as well as in the church throughout the world. In your holy name we pray. Amen.